The Woodlands Uncensored. Go. We're back. Hey, we're back alive. How about that, Dan? We took a little break. Uh, you know, at, at my age, I got to uh, take a little uh, break for the bathroom every now and then. Anyway, remember us on Facebook, The Woodlands Uncensored, on YouTube, The Woodlands Uncensored, and you can always email us at thewoodlandsuncensored at gmail.com, and we do read those things every day, although we don't reply to every one of them. We've had a number of them. Anyway, we're back with Dan Hauser. Dan gave us some good information on The Woodlands, how he worked with George Mitchell, how it started. And I think we're going to get into a little detail on some of the nonprofits to start with, right, Dan? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think, uh, uh, you know, in all my conversations, I might use the word we, but I played very little role, more than a fan and a, and sometimes a participant, but more than that, a helpful in influencing the community to some of the things that needed to get done. And, uh, and George was very smart and intuitive, and he knew what needed to happen. And he knew that the nonprofits and the churches were critical to the organiz to the community, as well as to the success of the, of the Woodlands. So many of you are familiar with Interfaith and, and the activities and, yeah. and support he gave that organization of trying to grow the churches uh, and with that, the nonprofits in the area. And I think uh, most people don't know that John Cooper School was originated by George and, and started. And uh, we got involved in that with him. Uh, he started the Houston Area Research Center. Skip Porter uh, was instrumental in taking that to the next level uh, within our community. And, and uh, I think it was very important to, to stress the technological and uh, medical and uh, you name it, the, the environmental type issues that were out there. And George was right on the forefront, knocking on the door of trying to solve problems. It goes down to the Super Duper Collider project that we tried to get here in the area. Again, we were not successful, but made a vain attempt at it. Uh, I think the uh, one of the things that, that happened through Hark was the supercomputer. Yeah. And they built a building in the Woodlands to put this large supercomputer to sell space to all other companies around or whatever. And he was so far ahead of the rest of the world in regards to this. But the interesting part is the size of the computer was an office building and probably the size of a computer today that had the same capabilities is about this big. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Just and uh, and so, so that went by the wayside. He had a lot of failures. He had he tried to do a lot of things, and a lot of things failed. But typically, they came around later on. Okay, in another form or fashion. You know, I mean, I love the the story about the the streets that have the rock in them, and the uh, the the lights that are on the streets had this square feature with this box up there and the light would come straight down and they look real pretty architecturally. They, they were great. Uh, but from a maintenance standpoint and an upkeep standpoint and that he was going to donate the land or the uh, roads to the County, uh, they weren't going to maintain them. So he, all of his efforts to have these streets that were, they looked like in the sunlight, gold shining down them. Uh, Exposed uh, aggregate streets. Yeah, uh, the the rocks. I live off of one in Rogan's Mill right now. Yeah, they're, they're they're right there today, and some of the lights are still there. I think the interesting part about the lights had this nice little box up there, and the lights would come straight down, but ended up birds and vultures would live and <laughs> perch <laughs> perch in them so that uh you know it didn't look too good having vultures <laughs> hanging around on your lights as you're coming into the woodlands trying to sell them uh, <laughs> so uh he had some interesting things that that went awry uh i think uh all of them he had opposition to uh, the county taking over the roads uh had to form a road district put hark together 
I think one of the interesting ones was Cynthia Woods Mitchell Pavilion. I mean, that was a huge one that we got to get involved in, and uh, and everybody thought he was crazy uh, that it was never going to work, you know, and uh, no one's going to come out here to go outside in Texas and watch uh, performances of for sure the Houston Symphony, and now it's one of the most successful outdoor theaters in the world. Uh, as is our community, one of the more outstanding cities in, in the United States. So I think, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things came to fruition, sometimes by circumstance, sometimes very much delayed. And that was just fun getting involved and, and being a part of it. I think uh, one of the things that I was able to be involved in was the Woodlands Community Association mm -hmm. and its early life where it was totally controlled by the developer in the early days and, and now, now it's the it's it's the woodlands uh what is the township it's what is the township now it started off as the woodlands community association mm -hmm. and the woodlands commercial development association okay two separate associations yeah. within the within the community and one he drove totally with the commercial side of the equation and then he on the residential, he allowed there to be, uh, you know, electorate uh, board as a minority interest, basically, in the community association. And over time, that evolved and grew. And uh, Michael Page and others were involved in developing the the plan, basically, the the plan for the township and where it was going to go and what the population would be and how it would evolve to George not having uh, control. Uh, yeah, with just the complexity of the mud districts alone. Oh yeah, the mud districts alone. Oh, Again, we had at the time four or five muds, now the weather 12 or so uh, in the area. And, and the beauty of him putting together with Michael Page and others, uh, the Joint Powers Association uh, and, and for all the woods, MUDs worked together. They had central administration, and and uh, that was uh, a feat in itself. And uh, and I don't even know how they would ever unwind that. But bottom line is, uh, it was very successful. And uh, some of the MUD districts don't have any debt anymore. They've been so successful. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I think there's misconceptions there is. Uh, Everybody sort of knows George's dream. Yes. Uh, only a few people probably left in the woodlands that have a real good feel for that. Yeah. And I'm willing to tell you that not too many people know what George would do. I do know this, that he would do it and he would drive it and he would make it successful. And he wasn't real hot about losing control of the Woodlands Community Association and what is now to township. I think he went along with it. Uh, and there's a lot of misconception, I think, a lot of misconception as to what he did or what he would do. Uh, and, I, and I feel very strongly that George would adapt and he would change with the environment mm -hmm. and he'd work with what was there. In that case, uh, the ETJ, being within the ETJ of Houston, but doesn't mean he liked it didn't mean there wasn't some way to get around it and for it to be an independent community and because that's what it operated with. Well, one of, one of the things I heard is that right up front, he wanted the Woodlands to be a city. Is that correct? Did you, did you see it that way? Yeah, well, he knew that we were destined to be part of the, um, of the, uh, uh, within the ETJ of Houston and they could annex us, but if you'll remember correctly, and some of them don't have short memories of what happened in Clear Lake City and then what happened in Kingwood, they did not go over well. They were disastrous and, right. and, and were forced to join Houston. And there's a lot of bad sentiment and a lot of bad press on that. And so that's when it sort of started that people were getting sort of scared as to whether they would be uh, uh, taken over. And by, by Houston, and that's when some of our political leaders, the so Tommy Williams and the Rob Eislers and the 
County Judge and the Kevin Brady's and you name it, uh, lots of people got involved in seeing what we could do, uh -huh. seeing what we could do. And they developed this township. They developed uh, agreements with them, the Colson Tufts of the world, Bruce Tuff, Nelda Blairs. I can go on down the list of people who were familiar with where, where we were going on the political side. Ed Chance, county commissioner at the time. Um, and so they all got together to try to make it so that we could prevent ourselves from being annexed by Houston. And they were very successful in making that happen. But uh, given that's House Bill 1149 or 1049 or something like that in the legislature that was passed, isn't that correct? Right. They, they had passed something the legislature and, and, and they did it again not too long ago where it would be have to be um, to be annexed. You'd have to have the vote of the populace. So right. that right there is, is a real plus. I mean, that's, right. that's the coup de grace of the success of it was that the public is going to have to want it. Yeah. OK. And uh, and which is the way it probably should be. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh where, where it's going to evolve uh, this recent incorporation initiative and and effort while i know some people's hearts are in it uh i guarantee you all i all i would say is i don't think the community is ready for it okay yeah. and uh, and doesn't have all the information and doesn't see a real good plan out there that makes sense without going into debt, without taking on strong taxes, without working agreements out with people. So again, not trying to to uh, be too political here. I, I can just say this, that uh, the decision was made rightfully so by the community. And, uh, and there's a lot of work and a lot of effort needs to be made among people who are uh, independent and, and want to uh, make sure that George's ambitions or designs for this community uh, are met. Uh, Continue on. He wanted to make it better. He wanted to make it better. He didn't want us to be like the city down the street. Yeah. Okay. And we're he not. Yeah. We are different and we're better. And it's been proven. And so it's, there's a formula that's been put in place that I think it's uh, it's important to understand how we got where we are and why we're as well respected and thought of as we are. It doesn't mean we don't have a lot of things to do yet and yeah. a lot of improvement. Uh, well, we're going to have uh, 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 people or uh, what you have called subject matter experts, and I like that a whole bunch, to talk yeah. about crime and talking right. about uh, uh, recreation, we're talking about uh, uh, the hospitals, uh, how the sheriff's department works here. There are a lot of there are a lot of nuances to the woodlands that really all come together and make this just a wonderful community to live you, in. You, you hit it on the nail, Pete. I mean, the, the the bottom line is is you know there needs to be a consensus of where we're going. There needs to be uh, support from all sides. There needs to be well thought out, well planned and understand the financial ramifications. And I think I think that'll happen. I think that'll happen if the right people are put in the right places. And uh, uh, and remember, George wanted to make things better. And so that's what we ought to be shooting for. But you just hit the nail when you said crime and urban development. We are no longer a residential community. Oh. We are now an urban center and things are gonna start growing up. And so we need to prepare ourselves for crime, for the traffic control, those kind of things. Those are the issues we should be debating and dealing with, not who's in control. Yeah. Uh, we need to be solving issues and not just, uh, um, you know, have a lot of rhetoric out there. But I want to ask you one other thing, and that is kind of, um, I'm trying to keep these at 30 minutes and I'm and sure. about 15 into this one. He sold the woodlands. He sold the Woodlands uh, Corporation. Uh, why in the world did he do that? Because he loved this. Well, uh, at one point in George's career, if I'm not mistaken, he started to have to get involved in some career 
financial planning as all of us do towards his family yep. and towards the company. And so he was getting on in age and I imagine Cynthia uh, pushed him a little bit to try to get his financial, get everything in order. Yep. And I think at the time, I think there was a demand for real estate was up. So as, if you're going to sell, sell when it's up. And, it? uh, and uh, same thing with the energy company. Let's see. Now he sold the energy company first, right? Uh, I think that's right. And got his $3.1 billion out of it. And so the bottom line was he, he was smart and astute and knew the right time to sell his company. And I think he wanted to spend more time on the real estate side and on Galveston and uh, Mitchell development of the Southwest properties he had in that. And so he wanted to spend more time on that. And then eventually uh, it became time, I think, after the mall got up and got successful and everything was going well. And so, again, that's the time that got to be said. The two major things were the mall and the um, um, uh, Cynthia Woods Mitchell Pavilion, the waterway, mm -hmm. uh, you name it. Those were real big in terms of making this a very solid uh, investment. He did. He also did a lot of development down in, in Galveston because he loved, he was born there. He loved Galveston. He did mm -hmm. a lot of investment. Uh, and uh, renovation, right? And I, I guess they call it the Strand down there. I'm not, I'm not real familiar. Yeah, he developed the Strand. He put a lot of money into Galveston. Colson Tuff was very much involved in all the architectural initiatives he had down there. Michael Richmond and others, uh, the San Luis Hotel and then the Convention Center, uh, and the Tremont House and uh, and mm -hmm. all of the things related to the Strand. I mean, he's they had some benevolent people, the Stewart family, the the Moody families, the <clears throat> Mitchell families, and Tillman Fertitta and his uh, his family, very strong, wealthy, born on the island people that uh, helped make that community uh, really made it nice. I think George went to uh, A&M. Uh, &M. <laughs> mm -hmm. He was yeah. in the service. I, I, I read that he was in the service. Yeah, he went to the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and they put him in charge of. Uh, uh, he actually worked with uh, the Howard Hughes Corp, Hughes Tool Company down yeah. in Houston, to make yeah. gun barrels for the war effort. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, the history of <laughs> him and the Howard Hughes Company in its own. You know, I can give another thirty minutes on Howard Hughes and and his involvement here and his banking relationship. Uh, in Houston before he moved to Vegas, okay? <laughs> and uh, and then how the worm turned and then they moved to Dallas and the public company uh, bought the Woodlands. Uh, it's interesting. And how Hughes, Hughes Tool, Hughes Christensen, right. Baker Hughes, uh, all of those companies, uh, you know, evolved, I guess you could yeah. say. As, and, a, as a side note, a friend of mine, owns one of the last jets that Howard Hughes owned and it, it he's got it up in Magnolia and it's pieced out. So he's got uh -huh. the cockpit in place uh -huh. and he's got uh, uh, some of the wings there, but that that's it. And when the, when uh, the market street was, uh, was uh, opening, uh, mm -hmm. I went to the guy that was the manager of the market street and I, and I said, listen, I'd like to donate I like a friend of mine owns this. I like to donate it and we'll fix it up. And so kids can go in and play like they're playing, flying Howard Hughes' jet. And it's really his plane. They didn't like my idea. Like most people don't like, <laughs> you know, like my ideas. But well, how much time do you have? I, I've got one store on Howard Hughes. I'll, I'll right. give you that. It's we'll related right ahead. Okay. Well, simple as this. I was 24, 25 year old loan officer. And account was transferred to me called the uh, Hughes tool. Uh, mm -hmm. And they had a small account with us at the bank. Uh, he had some business in our trust department, but he did most of his banking down the street, Texas Commerce Bank. Mm -hmm. And I pull up the file and it's about, you know, a quarter of an inch thick, it had three pieces of paper in it, had a financial statement for Howard Hughes from 1953. <laughs> okay. And what is this? I'm 77 or 76 at the time. 
And so we're going to go call on, on Howard Hughes. Well, he had just left. He's in Vegas. He wasn't there. So you had to deal with his president at the time. And it was a, name, a guy by the name of James Lesh. James Lesh. And so we go out to Howard Hughes on Navigation or Harrisburg, wherever it was. And there were guns and turrets and wire fences up and everything. He did secret work for the government. And you didn't get in there unless you were invited. And so we go in and God, we were sort of nervous. And we go visit with this guy, James Lesh. And we didn't know him from Adam, but he was Howard Hughes' number one man. Well, again, fast forward four years. I'm in the woodlands, renting a house on Slash Pine, and I need to go to see a doctor. And I go to the information center, but there was only one doctor in town at the time in the woodlands. <laughs> and the guy's name was Jack uh, Lesh, Dr. Jack Lesh. And I say, Jack Lesh, I've heard that he name can. somewhere before. He was Jane Lesh, is the president and CEO of Howard Hughes's mm -hmm. corporation's son. And he lived oh. in the Woodlands and was the first, first re uh, doctor in the Woodlands that I know of. There might've been another one, a Dr. Mock, but no, I'll be uh, just so as the word world turns, uh, here we are talking yeah. to, to Howard Hughes's uh, 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 senior officer. And, and then 20 years later, they come in and buy the whole yeah, and uh, in in uh, uh, Warren's book, uh, Cynthia uh, Mitchell, she kidded with uh, with George because he always wanted an overseas deployment when he was in the yeah. army, and so she said, "Well, go going from here to the island, the Galveston, that's overseas, so you know you're at your deployment." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that, that that's good, and and uh, and it's kind of funny because things come around, and Hughes is back. Here, but it was sold yeah. twice, I think, before Hughes actually bought it. Bought the well, that's part of the aggravation we had in the early days is when George tried to get a higher educational facility here, and he kept coming up against a brick wall. And and a lot of, most people don't know in the early days to form a bank, to form a hospital, to form a uh, mm -hmm. educational facility, you had to get state approval. You had to get a charter. You had to go it go through a charter process and that gave all the opposition the ability to stand up and go against you uh, and to try to or or your competition to, to go against you and and beat you out uh, for the charter and we had that problem with the bank we had that problem with the hospital and and George had that problem with the, uh, the University of Houston coming here is that uh, you know the A&M's and they tried to, oh, I don't know, stifle competition in the educational area. They didn't do that oh, all really? branching like they did in California. You had branches for the University of California everywhere, you know. And, uh, right. So it just uh, it's a way for the big guys to control the little guys is what it really yeah. would have amounted to. And George ran up against that. We were hoping he'd get A&M to have a, a place here and now it's evolved that Sam Houston is stepping in and going to have a, a, a good facility here at some time. So things work out. Mm -hmm. Things work out. Yeah, everything works out one way or the other. I well, the say. interesting one was, you know, we fought to get a community college here and it got declined. The public voted against it, mainly because Conroe didn't want us to have it. Okay. Oh. And so we lost the first time around and we didn't give up. We went back a few years later, a Mary Madison and John Wiesner and David Vogt and people in the community got together and we made it happen. And uh, and the Woodlands did it and they also put a location up on 242. I think that helped us a lot for it to be more centrally located. And that mm -hmm. initiative in itself got the community college to move their headquarters here. And now we have the headquarters of the largest community colony in the state of Texas and possibly in the United States. I don't know exactly, but uh, almost 100,000 students that, that right. go to uh, to now Lone Star Community College. So, Lone Star so uh, Star. again, yeah. failures on multiple fronts became a very success at the end. And that was that, mar that marked 
sort of George's story, I think, through the years. Yeah, yeah. that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot of people's story. Failure is is uh, in everybody's past, but you just got to keep persevering for what you love. Exactly. Uh, finally, well, I uh, found that out in banking, Pete. I found that out. In banking. Oh, I, guess, I, I, I like loaning money did. to people who have failed because they knew what they screwed up and they knew <laughs> what they had to do to be successful. Uh, well, I wish the hell I'd have met you back when I but I had I had knee pads on. I begged to so many bankers. Well, they're paying I, us, aren't they? I, I was buying a company in Ireland. Heck, I didn't even know where the hell Ireland was. So I went to the bank to borrow the money to buy the company in Ireland. And they said, what in the world are you doing buying a company in a country that you know nothing about? Yeah. I said, why, you know? I, it was New Year's Eve. I thought it was a good idea at the time. <laughs> well, try. you know, interesting. We, but it succeeded. I did some financing with companies that went and built structures over in Scotland and Ireland. A special financing uh -huh. was available at that time, and uh, and they were successful, as you were. <laughs> yeah. yeah, finally, finally, it took me a while. Well, listen, thank you so much. Uh, we may come up with something else and, and give you get another 30 minutes out of you, but I do want to talk to you about some of these other people like Michael Page. Oh, yeah. uh, you, you were gracious enough to invite me to your coffee club and, and we listened to him. And what a, what a wealth of knowledge Mike is. Yeah, he's, he's and, been through it all and he knows the angles and everything. Uh, you know, he knows where the skeletons are buried. <laughs> yeah. And uh really? and the struggles that George had. But you know, there are a lot of successes that just kept us kept us going. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. A lot of successes. Well, once again, this is the Woodlands Uncensored, mm -hmm. and uh, we urge you to write us at the Woodlands Uncensored at gmail.com and uh, put put anything you want on Facebook. I'm, I'm in Facebook jail for what happens with Facebook. And I didn't know this until I got in there is when you do a business type of account like this is not personal but business, they lock you out from making comments for, uh, for 30 days. Well, that's sure and so I'm locked out to <laughs> September 19th to make comments. Uh, but on YouTube, we get stuff on YouTube. And uh, anyway, so Dan, thank you thank so you, much. Pete, I appreciate it. I appreciate it, and and I look forward to talking to you in about two minutes when I walk over to the other <laughs> office. Take care. Right. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Dan. See you.